Welcome back, everybody, to our Apocalypse Survival Snippets with the cabal of unlikely suspects. Uh, we've uh, trimmed down a little bit uh, because we've had to record these you know, on several different occasions in order to make sure we had everybody available. And to this session, we're going to be talking about the Apocalypse Garden. As a matter of fact, if you're waiting until the apocalypse to plant your garden, you've almost waited too late, or you have waited too late. So what should we be looking at in our gardens? Uh, Kathy Smith has a degree in agronomy and is actually our acknowledged green thumb of the group. Um, and it has nothing to do with whether she's been bitten by the parrot at the moment. So, uh, Kathy, what should be in our gardens? Um, well, the first thing you want to do is when you're looking at what plants you want to put in your garden, look at what vegetables and fruits you use in your cooking. Uh, and which ones are appropriate for your uh, plant zone. Um, so I'm up in Minnesota, and the part of Minnesota I'm in is called Zone 4, which means that if I want tomatoes, I have to plant seedlings. I, I, if I want to plant seeds, I have to start them indoors ahead of time because the growing season up here is shorter. This is going to vary, of course, depending upon where you are in the world. Um, but when you start planning out what you want in your garden, start looking at what you use in your cooking. Um, for that, uh, because of that, I have two types of parsley in my garden. I have multiple uh, bunches of dill that mature throughout the summer. Um, I have sage growing in the understory. Uh, I have tomatoes. I have onions that I let grow feral in a section of my garden so that throughout the year, and even for multiple years, I can just go out there, pull up some onion stalks, and I've got them ready to go. Because these are things that I use frequently in my cooking. Okay, sounds good. I'm going to pop up an image here. Let me pull up uh, Zoom, and I'm going to share a screen. Let's see if I can bring this up. Okay, I have an image in paint and we're looking at that zone map that uh, Kathy was talking about and you can see the hardiness zones and part of what we are looking at is the uh, minimum temperatures the extremes um, and so up where Kathy is where are we we're in a fairly dark blue region with the uh, uh, temperatures getting down to about minus 20 to minus 25 uh, degrees Fahrenheit. So again, that leaves her with a fairly short growing season. Uh, now you take uh, where I'm located in North Carolina, and we're in a fairly light green zone where our minimum temperatures on average only get down to about zero at our worst case. I don't believe I've seen uh, sub-zero temperatures more than about two or three times in 30 years. Uh, Brent, you're from the Los Angeles area mm -hmm. and you are in an orange zone in which the minimum temperature is just barely going to hit freezing, uh, freezing point of water. Uh, and we have uh, uh, members of our cabal from Texas and they're uh, in San Antonio, they're a light brown where their minimums might be about 15 to 20 degrees Fahrenheit. So the uh, that minimum also gives us an indication of our growing season. Yes. And if I and can that, find a chart for that, I will bring that up as well. Okay. So now that you've decided, okay, these are the plants I want to grow. One of the next things that you're going to want to look at is your soil. And not all soil is the same. I have a beautiful dark brown prairie mollusol in my backyard. 
It's rich in organic matter. It's very fine. I can plant gosh darn near anything in it and I get beautiful, beautiful results. The same is not true in other parts of the country where other ecotypes exist, other soil types. So if you can find a soil testing kit, start getting a soil, uh, test your soil. What minerals is it short of? Um, branch out, talk to your local county cooperative extension, your state funds extension agents that help. And you can get hooked up with master gardener classes, you can talk to professionals, you can talk to specialists, and you can learn what are the best gardening techniques for your area. And this is going to give you a huge jump start on, okay, so do I want to plant directly into my ground or do I want to do a raised bed with potting soil? And if you use potting soil, you don't necessarily have to worry about creating your own soil that's going to be better suited or optimized for the crops that you want to grow. Uh, back home, we faced the situation where there was a lot of clay, uh, especially because we, uh, the housing development is on cut and fill. So where our uh, garden was part of the cut zone. So if you start digging down, you're hitting clay pretty quickly. We have a garden that's um, cinder blocks and to raise it up. And last time we redid the garden, we brought in about a ton and a half of soil and fertilizer to get a sufficient thickness of soil over the area that we were planting in. Yes. So that's gonna be, that's gonna be a shortcut version. If you don't have access to clean fill soil or topsoil, you then have to start figuring out how to make your soil work for you. And that's usually going to involve creating your own organic matter from compost, which will be a mixture of um, plant material, decaying plant material, um, animal-based fertilizers, uh, sometimes even things like bone meal if you're short on calcium. Uh, and, and this is going to make your gardening operation more sustainable over time. The and more if you've you improve... Got, yeah, and if you've got clay, uh, you need to break up the clay. So uh, lime and a little bit of sand to give something that actually breaks it up. Even something like taking the clay and working in bales of straw, working in old grass clippings. When that clay is workable, you start incorporating this plant material and that is going to help break up the clay clods and it's also going to help put in nutrients. Uh, in my situation, I have a pet parrot. Every time we clean out that pet parrot's cage, all of the shavings that catch all of the bird poop, we dump them in our garden. That acts as a very basic fertilizer. If you raise chickens, you can make a really good fertilizing compost out of grass clippings, water, and chicken droppings. I have popped up the uh, first and last frosts that will give us an idea of growing season. Uh, in Kathy's zone four, average first frost is in September and the average last frost is in May. So basically June through August is her growing season. Uh, here in North Carolina, we're in zone seven where our average first frost is in October and last frost is in April. Uh, our growing season then runs basically May through September. Although you'll find that a lot of plants actually uh, start off as seedlings. Uh, we, we see a lot of our uh, uh, flowering bushes and trees will blossom in March and then get damaged by the frost. And that's not something that you want to have happen to your garden. So uh, starting things out in a hothouse or starting them indoors uh, is another way to extend your growing season. Yes, and if you're like me, I planted, I was a little anxious this year. I put in my plants before the last frost 
So when I was, I was watching the weather forecast and I saw where we were going to get below freezing at night. So I went out there and I covered up my garden with a tarp and a couple of bricks to keep the tarp down just so that those plants would stay warm and survive the frost. Yeah, um, yes. Uh, other things to consider is seed quality and seed quantity. Um, the quality uh, is denoted by the germination rate of your seeds. Um, the seeds that you buy from the large box stores are not necessarily the top quality of seeds. Uh, they are not necessarily optimized for your geographic location either. If you want to start off with the better seeds, which are going to have a higher percentage of germination, which may be more acclimated to your area, see if you can't find a local greenhouse. Uh, find a local seed company. Um, it, I grew up in Wisconsin. I knew of at least two seed companies that everyone in Wisconsin swore by because they had the good stuff. You know, it was the stuff that could handle the northern winters. When I moved down to Mississippi, I didn't order from that seed catalog because it was optimized for up north. I was living farther down south, so I actually ordered seed from a company out of Florida because it was closer to the climate type that I wanted to grow in. Now, the other thing you can consider if you are, uh, if you have the good fortune to have built yourself a greenhouse or some sort of structure, there are um, some hanging uh, devices that you can use. But if you buy it off of the TV or if you buy it off of that wish ad in the, uh, uh, on, along your Facebook feed, uh, it may not actually be something that works all that well. Uh, I happen to live in an area that's between two uh, fairly good sized cities, but we're in the suburbs, we're in the garden area, and we have a feed and seed about a mile away. And there are farms in our area and there are uh, ranches, there are horse farms to the north of us, and we also have um, various tobacco and uh, corn and green bean. Uh, fields and farms around us. So the feed and seed is actually where people go to get um, most of their uh, most of their gardening supplies. Um, speaking on the other end, as not worrying about cold, um, coming from Los Angeles, uh, our temperatures are good enough that we can pretty much grow year round, and we have. The problem is actually with heat at times, and we've actually had to set up umbrellas and shade so that plants wouldn't get cooked in yes. the temperature. Um, another thing to consider with that, and most people don't realize, is you have to be careful when you water. Because yes. if you're watering during the heat, that's going to ruin the plants. So you have to either get up very early to water the plants early enough where they can dry out before you have the heat or you have to stay up quite a bit later until the heat's broken and then water then. I yep. remember having to get up at 4 a.m. one time <laughs> because it was going to be a scorcher and I was out there half asleep watering the garden at four in the morning because it was already like 78 degrees. What type of mix of plants do we want? Obviously, we want to be able to grow vegetables. Uh, is strictly food production everything that you're going to plant in that garden? Uh, no. So you have plants that are dual purpose. You have sun sunflowers. Sunflowers are beautiful. They're gorgeous. They also have sunflower seeds in the fall, which are a source of food. And if you get enough of them, they're a source of oil. Um, so, you know, you have dual purpose flowers, but again, you can also do plants purely for enjoyment. Um, I have at the house I'm at now, the previous owners installed a sandbox in the backyard. I don't have a use for a sandbox. So I dug out the sand, 
I added some topsoil and I bought a whole bunch of cheap one year past their expiration date seed packets for it was something like 10 for a dollar. So if they didn't grow, I wasn't out anything. I just cut them up and I just spread them all over that seed box because I didn't care. And for two years now, I have had a beautiful riot of flowers that bloom and mature throughout the summer. And they don't really serve any purpose other than to make me happy when they bloom. Well, I might argue that they do serve another purpose, which is uh, most of us in the city think of insects as nuisance. But when you are a uh, uh, when you are gardening, the uh, insects are going to help you with your pollination, and there are going to be certain insects are going to help with aeration of the soil and breakdown of organic compounds and the like. So um, your flower garden actually serves a purpose as well. Oh yes, it does. Um, and I should mention that I um, as well. I have a degree in entomology, so my garden. My flower garden uh, does bring in pollinators and it's close enough to my actual production garden that um, I get a number of beneficial insects, uh, predatory insects that they come in for the pollen, they stay for a caterpillar snack, um, which works out really well for me. I've only had to put insecticide on my uh, production garden once this year. Um, and, you know, uh, there's a lot of attention that's focused on bees as pollinators. They are not the only ones. Beetles are pollinators. They're also predators. Um, wasps are pollinators. They're also predators. Uh, so while we might not necessarily like wasps, they do a lot of hard work in a garden. Um, and but you know on the other hand you do have insects that you do need to watch out and control for simply because they might not have a lot of natural predators or given the bounty of your garden they are pop their population can grow to such high numbers before the predators can catch up that you lose a lot of your garden production um, so if you're doing your garden check on it once a day, once every two days. Go out there. If you see holes in your leaves, start looking at the underside. Start seeing, start try to figure out who's making the holes. Uh, if you see plants that are healthy and they're wilting, start looking at the stems. Start seeing if you have a caterpillar inside that stem that is eating away at your plant. Um, if you start noticing leaves that are curling, that's when you might want to get on the internet and start looking up plant diseases. I noticed that two of my tomato plants, the growing ends were, were curling and becoming um, thin and spire-like. Turns out two of my plant, tomato plants were infected with uh, curly leaf virus, which is transmitted by white flies in spring can't do anything about it. They're infected. I get little thumb-sized tomatoes from those plants. Half of the tomato is scar tissue. I can get something out of it, but if this was an apocalyptic situation, I would be out quite a bit of tomato production. Another thing to consider is plants that are complementary to each other. Yes. Back home, we're set up for square foot gardening. So each plot is divided into one foot by one foot squares. So instead of having an entire plot of tomatoes, we'll have tomatoes, we'll have, um, uh, you can have beans, you can have uh, different things all next to each other. So you might pick a plant that is very nitrogen dependent and then pick a plant that also tends to fix nitrogen in the soil so that you're not leaching out from, uh, over uh, the season, especially if you have a longer growing season and you're going to, like we do at home, you're going to be producing zucchini for, you know, 10 months of the year. Uh, you you want to be able to keep that uh, garden bed going for that entire time period. 
And don't forget, tomatoes plus onions plus jalapeno peppers and a good rainstorm equals salsa. <laughs> Uh, so that's it for this segment. Thank you for joining us. And thank you, Kathy and Brent, uh, for uh, being with us for this particular snippet. And I hope you tune in for our other Apocalypse Rising 4 survival snippets by the cabal of unlikely suspects. Because remember, we are completely harmless. <laughs>